Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you want to be sure to never miss an episode of the podcast, I encourage you to follow us using your favorite podcast software, including Apple Podcasts, Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio app, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net. And you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go over to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of Sam Spade. The original air date, April the 10th, 1949, and the title is The Stopped Watch Keeper. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Quote the Raven, nevermore. Yes? This is me. Is this Mr. Spade? Yes, but is this Miss Perrine? Oh, yes, but... Why are you eating a peanut butter sandwich at this time of night? Why the allusion to Poe's raven? Was your assignment among the literati? It certainly was. There was uh, Rowena from Ivanhoe, a lost Lenore, a no-place Ralph, and a Boris from the Karloff of the same name. Oh, how distinguished. Have you got a cold, F? No. Well, uh, then there was a carnivorous plant, a hideous meat-eating specimen of the botanical world, trying to take two fingers off me. Oh! <gasps> Well, I've got three fingers all poured out for you here. Ah, oh, pretty hip. I can see you intend to be terribly amusing tonight. But even so, I intend to come right down and dictate my report on a stopped watch caper or time stood still. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Well, in a few weeks, many of us will be going bareheaded now and then, meaning we'll have to pay more attention than ever to the appearance of our hair. The best way I know to always keep your hair in trim is to use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, removes loose dandruff, and relieves dryness, which may be even more prevalent when your hair is exposed directly to the wind and sun. So right away, get the 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. I'm looking over a falling Hello, Sam. That's a mighty sharp routine you give a purine on the phone. Where's Effie? Who are you? Sam, don't you remember me? Buffy. Certainly not. I never saw... Buffy, Buffy, wait a minute. Do I uh, sense a certain family resemblance? No, you can't be Effie's little sister, Buffy. Yes. Big girl now. But thanks anyway for the tinker toys you sent me last Christmas. I kill myself. <laughs> I intend to start having children of my own just as soon as it's practical. Hmm. Where's that, Buff? She had to go to L.A. to visit a sick friend. A likely story. No, really. Chapter and verse, please. St. Joseph's Hospital in Burbank. They went to school together and her name is Lorene Tuttle. She's an actress. Yes, I know. A very fine actress. Is it serious? I hope not for Effie's sake. They're very close. Yeah. Well, uh, what now? Uh, you uh, take shorthand, Buff? Sort of. Spoken like a true Perrine. Come on in. <laughs> well, I hope it's good and gruesome. <clears throat> uh, I take it back. I meant the caper, not what you're drinking. Okay, Buff, you win. Ready? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, date April 10, 1949, to uh, Deputy Sheriff Bill Woodington, Marin County Sheriff's Office, San Rafael, California, from Samuel Spade, license number... Uh... 137596. Oh, steady listener. Uh, subject, the stopped watch caper. Dear Bill, here's how it turned out. And if I ever phone you for advice again, I'll take it because you were right. She was loaded. What about those threatening letters, Sam? Don't give another thought. Old Lady Raven has had me up there a dozen times the last six weeks. Got threatening letters, she got prowlers, but when I got there, she can't find the letters, and the way that house is tucked away in the woods, I don't think a prowler could find it. How do I find it, Bill? Huh? Well, the Gray Line bus goes right by the gate. Mount Tema Palais Road, about three miles this side of Rock Spring. Well, that sounds pretty rugged. You, uh, say she's a crank. But she's got money, Sam. Oh, the poor old soul. And she got a niece. Oh? Yeah. Over 23, but she's stacked. Hmm, the old lady's loaded, the niece is stacked. Who else lives there? Well, there's a butler. Somebody flattened his head when he was young, and he wears bangs to call attention to it. Sort of shuffles around the house. But you ought to see him out in the woods chasing them old ground squirrels. Quick as a deer, hound. Yeah, and, 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 and Never then mind, there... never mind. You sold me. All these marvels I have got to see. <laughs> It was only 3 in the p.m. when I skulked in through the gates of Ravenswood, but it was so dark the hooty owls hadn't gone to bed yet. The fog snaked in and out through the dripping trees, the long, chill ribbons of ghastly fog borne on a sobbing wind. I mushed on into the deepening gloom of the forest primeval. After 10 minutes of that, I began to wonder if there was any house there. When I saw it, I still wondered. It looked more like a fungus growth. It is chilly, isn't it, sir? Won't you come in? Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I expected that. If you'll be so kind as to wait here, sir, I'll inform Miss Rowena of your arrival. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy Stewart. Boris, who's out there? Is it the man with the hemlock? Answer me, you brute! I... Oh, where is it? Did you say hemlock? Oh, you must be my aunt's detective. Spade, was it? It is, right. I'm Ralph Raven. Come along with me, Spade. I have something interesting to show you. Ralph Raven was the one member of the household you hadn't described to me, and no wonder. The wasted figure that looked up at me from the wheelchair was more like a ghost than a man. His face was chalk white. So white it seemed almost luminous, and the skin clung so close to his skull there seemed to be no flesh beneath it. And his wide, staring eyes looked like two cups of black coffee on a snow-white tablecloth. I followed him into a glass-enclosed room, only slightly larger than a garden court at the plaza. The humidity was several points higher than the dripping woods, and the temperature was several degrees lower. But the plants he had growing there seemed to thrive on it. As I edged nervously through the dense, quivering foliage, I noticed a strange-looking yellow-green pod, about the size of a milk bottle at the end of a long, tubular stem. It leaned over, opened its red mouth, and said, Hey, what is that thing? Oh, that's my Sarancenia gigantosa. Meat eater. Carnivorous plant. Don't be frightened. I just fed it. Uh, don't tell me. You know what it eats? Uh, acts like it needs a dose of bicarb. No, perfectly healthy. Merely part of the digestive process. Even as you and I. Not me. But over here, you're a detective. These plants should interest you. Oh, oh, don't touch that mandrake. Never thought of it. It won't cry out. No vocal cords. Oh, I see. It's very sensitive. Oh, sensitive. And deadly poison. Oh. And, and see here, these pretty purple blossoms? Yes, yeah, very pretty. Source of an alkaloid poison favored by the Borgias. And these, white hellebore. Watch your language. I use it in compounding veratria. A poison so ancient it would probably go undetected in the police laboratories of today. Mm -hmm. And here, here's a charming one. Both a killer and a medicine. Belladonna, or deadly nightshade, source of atropine. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, commonly known as Nux vomica, well. produces not one but two deadly poisons. 
The well-known strychnine and the rare and not easily detectable Brucey. Yeah, well, it's uh, quite a hobby, Mr. Ray. Why, it's not a mere hobby, Mr. Spade. It's a practical science. All the plants in this conservatory have their fatal properties. And all have played a role in the great times of history. Did my aunt get another threatening letter? So she says. Odd that she should fear death at her age. And odd that she should hire a bodyguard. How does she know how it'll come? It might be poison. Speaking of poison, brother dear, it's time for your medicine. Oh, Spade, my sister, the lost Lenore. How do you do, Mr. Spade? How do you do? Here, Ralph, drink up. Why does it always have to be in milk? Hey, look here, it's not time anyway. Oh, the confounded watch has stopped again. Spade, what time do you have? Why, it's uh, three... Uh... Oh, that's funny, my watch has stopped too. I didn't know then what that meant. In fact, if you look on the last page of this report, Deputy dear, you'll see that the stopwatch was the key to the whole puzzle. I protest that my failure to realize its significance at that moment had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that my client's niece, Lenore Raven, was, as you so roguishly put it, stacked. About there, uh, Boris the butler bobbed up and beckoned me from the balustrade. I followed him upstairs and was ushered into the austere and regal presence of my client, Rowena Raven. That would be all, Boris. Yes, madam. Oh, Boris, I just remembered. Yes, madam? There on the occasional table, my watch. I want you to take it around to the watchmakers in the morning. It's on the fritz again. Yes, madam. Mr. Spade, I must apologize for keeping you waiting. Oh, it's all right. My watch hasn't been keeping proper time ever since those threatening letters started. Would that be a clue, Mr. Spade? Uh, maybe we'd better start with the letters, Mrs. Raven. I can't find them anywhere. I think that young man from the sheriff's office must have pinched him. Bill Whittington? Oh, I'm sure not. Well, all the same, it's very odd that every time he comes here, he can't find him. Uh, well, where did you put him, Mrs. Raven? Right there on the occasional table. Yeah, well, uh, Mrs. Raven, sometimes uh, people have very vivid dreams. Huh? It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with their minds or anything like that. You but... talk just like Dr. Slosser. That young sawbones my niece sent around looked my sciatica. Sciatica is nothing but a pain. How can you look at it? It's a lot of bull. Yeah. Uh, what did the letters say, uh, Mrs. Raven? That's why I wondered about my watch, Mr. Spade. The letters always contain some reference to time. Your time is running out. Beware when time moves slowly. Soon it may stop altogether. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. You think there could be a connection? I mean, has someone been tampering with my watch? The repairman doesn't know what's causing it to lose. Yeah, did he think it might have been tampered with? No. He thought it was something in the mountain. Magnetism or something. Well, that sounds logical. That's now, a lot of hooey. I lived here 40 years and my watch never lost a minute. Something in the mountain. My eye. Something in this house, more like. Or somebody. You ask me, he's not half so sick as he pretends to be. Your nephew? Uh-huh. What do you think? Well, I think he's a very sick man. No wonder. Sitting in that damp conservatory day after day, pattering over those fiendish poisonous plants. You see the one that eats mice and hamburgers? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, what's supposed to be the matter with your nephew, Mrs. Raven? Oh, he was in an auto accident. Injured his neck. He had to remove part of a gland or something. His neck. But Dr. Slosser says he's in good condition aside from that. And if he takes his medicine faithfully, there's no reason why he should Come in! Ah, Mrs. Raven, how is that pain this afternoon? Worse, thank you. Dr. Slosser, this is Mr. Spade. Ah, yes. The detective you engaged to investigate those uh, letters you've been receiving. Mr. Spade thinks it's an inside job. Don't you, Mr. Spade? Uh, well, that depends on what you mean by an inside job. There, you see? Inside that romantic imagination of yours, my dear lady. Hold still now oh. while I give you your shot. I loathe being jabbed. Oh. Well, now, oh. that wasn't so bad, was it? Oh, uh, can I work on? How is Ralph getting on, Doctor? Not well, I'm afraid. He doesn't oh. seem to be responding to the... Oh. Mrs. Raven, what is it? Uh, poison. You poison me. Oh. <laughs> The cry she uttered was only half as terrible as the expression on her pain-contorted face. She pitched forward in her chair with both fists clenched and shaking as if in anger at the doctor standing before her. He put down the empty hypodermic on the occasional table. Yeah. Help me carry it to the couch. Yeah, sure. The, take away that pillow. Yeah. She must lie perfectly flat. Uh... 
There. That's better now. She's relaxing. I'm dying. There was poison in that needle. Please, Mrs. Raven, it was only sedative. To make you sleep. Let me sleep. Let me sleep. The time is running out. The poor woman. Malignant condition. Only a matter of time. Does she know? That she has only a short time to live? Oh, yes. Well, I have another call. Do, do you have the time my watch seems to have stopped? Another one. I beg your pardon? Uh, nothing. I left my watch at home. Oh, Ludwig. well, I... Ludwig, something terrible Shh, is happening. Your aunt is sleeping. You'd better come down to the conservatory right away. Ralph is in terrible pain. What kind of pain? He keeps saying he, he's been poisoned. What? Well, come along. Take that hypo to the kitchen door and sterilize it. Where is it? On the table there. I... He stopped on his tracks. His mouth fell open and he gave to the tabletop where he put down the hypodermic. In its place, it appeared two items. An old-fashioned lady's watch and a note written in green ink. The note said, time must have a stop. I picked up the watch and held it to my ear. You guessed it. It wasn't ticking. I had a hunch my client wasn't either. And I was right. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men... And women and children, too. And now, back to the stop watch keeper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Ralph? Ralph, where are you? Where did you leave you? Hey, wait. Over here. Oh, Spade... Keep them away from me. Ralph, I came as soon as I could. T tell me your symptoms. No. I phoned for another doctor. He's on his way now. Spade, my aunt. Take me to her. I must tell her. Tell her what? I'm afraid we have some bad news for you, Ralph. Your aunt is dead. Oh. So you poisoned her, too. Oh, Ralph, you're sick. You don't know what you're saying. She's been to every specialist in the country. They all said the same thing. They all said she was good for another three months. My dear boy, in these cases, any doctor's guess is as bad as the next. No. Please, Ralph, you're very sick. Please let Ludwig examine you. If it's what you think, the other doctor may be too late. <laughs> Why not? Why should I fear death? That's better. Now let me see your eyes. Uh -huh. So? So, open the mouth. So... What is it? What is it? He's right. It is poison. You see? You, you know, see? my dear. Yes? When you sterilized that needle for Ralph's shot this morning, did you pick up the wrong bottle? Of course not. Strange. It's very strange. But don't worry, Ralph. There's a very simple antidote. Oh, thank heaven. You should, my dear. Indeed, you should. <laughs> And that was that, Deputy Deer. Two doctors and the county coroner took one look at my late client's medical history and decided on death due to natural causes. I didn't think so, and neither did you. So there really were threatening letters? I saw one. You sure now, Sam? Sure, I'm sure. Where'd you say it was? On the occasional table. Yeah. 
What was you doing when it wasn't the table? Not occasionally, occasional. Oh, just any old table. No, Bill, now, Bill, get this. It's real deep. An occasional table is a table that a woman picks up at a bargain and puts into a room under the mistaken impression that it may come in handy someday. Mrs. Raven used hers as a catch-all for her unanswered correspondence, threatening letters included. And what happened to the one you saw? I don't know. I put it right here in my coat pocket along with a watch. It just disappeared. Well, that might be tampering with evidence. Listen, Bill, things were disappearing from that table almost as fast as other things showed up. Yeah, sounds like pack rat. You follow that up, Bill. I'm going to pack up and rat out of here. Now look, Sam. My client's dead. It's officially okay. I haven't made a penny out of the caper, and now I'm not likely to. So do you give me a lift back to the toll gate, or do I hitchhike? <laughs> There's your answer. Come on. When we reached the second bedroom, whence the scream had come, we found the lost Lenore looking well found and something comfortable. She's standing center stage, regarding herself with horror at a full-length mirror. She looks awful pale, Bill. You better get downstairs and get some ice water. She might faint. You think so? Yeah, hurry up. I'll stay here and keep up her circulation in case anything happens. Yeah, you're right. Beat it. Oh, Oh, it's you, Sam. I thought... You thought what? Look. Look, I found these on my pillow. Mm. One watch, one threatening letter. Whose watch? Mine. I left it on the dressing table when I went in to cream my face. When I came out, somebody had slipped this under it. On the dressing table? No, under my pillow. You said on your pillow. I meant under. I mean on. I don't know what I mean. What are you trying to do to me? Just trying to get things straight. But the note. Look at it. It's exactly the same as the one he left in my aunt's room. Why do you say he? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do. It's because I don't trust Ludwig. Dr. Schlosser. That figures he doesn't trust you either. But he pretended to think I might have picked up the wrong bottle. Mm-hmm. Oh, he was acting. Couldn't you see? You're not doing a bad job yourself. I'm not acting, not anymore. Listen to me. Listen, he's acted strangely ever since I foolishly said I'd marry him. I would myself. Oh, Sam, darling, don't joke. I don't mean like that. How did you meet him? He, he got me out of a jam once. The accident. Oh, my brother was hurt. I went for a doctor and he happened to be the nearest one... Well, I'd been drinking, and he took over, and he sent me home before the police arrived at the scene. Didn't Ralph know? He blanked out. He doesn't know to this day. Ludwig never forgot. He forced me to recommend him to my aunt. He got into her good graces, practically moved into the house. Then he pretended to make love to me. Pretended? He didn't care about me till he found out about my aunt didn't have long to live. He knew half her money would come to me. Sam, do you think he poisoned my aunt? Officially, she died from natural causes. But you said she spoke about being poisoned. And Ralph, too. What's that medicine you give him in milk? I don't know. It's a prescription, just some drops that come in a, in a metal container. Where do you keep those drops? Here. Here in my room. I have to hide them. They make Ralph feel so much better. He used to overdose when the doctor trusted him to dose himself. Let me see that medicine. Yes, it's, it's, it's just here in this cabinet. Here. Here it is. It's right. <gasps> Don't tell me. It's empty. There there was a glass bottle inside the container. Mm, Small but heavy. Lead yet. Hey, what are you doing with that gadget? The thing with the dials and the speedometer. Oh, that's something medical. I have to make a test on Ralph every day to see how he's getting along. Do you know what that actually is? Yes, I do. It it detects anemia. Well, I wouldn't know about that, but a Geiger counter is generally used to detect something else. What what, what are you going to do with it? I'm going prospecting for that missing medicine. Ah, there you are. I've been looking everywhere for you. I'm afraid I have bad news for you, Lenore. Well? My diagnosis was correct. Pernicious anemia. Dead. What is that you are carrying, Mr. Spade? Oh, uh, nothing special, doctor. Just an old Geiger counter. Lenore, did you let him take it? He said he was going to use it to find Ralph's medicine. What happened to Ralph's medicine? I don't know. It's just gone. Mr. Spade, that machinery is my property. I must ask you to hand it over. No gun necessary, Doctor. Here, take uh, it. Take your gun, too, sir. Lenore, carry the machine this way. Walk ahead of us. First, we try the conservatory. He was an amateur with a gun, but I didn't jump him for it because I'm an amateur with a Geiger. I did notice that the indicator on the dial got nervous the minute we walked into the conservatory. Ralph Raven's body was still in the wheelchair, no paler in death than in life. His sightless eyes were fixed on that obscene plant. The plant looked sick, too was drooping and his red mouth was hanging open. 
We walked past the wheelchair. The indicator on the dial of the Geiger counter moved forward and then slipped back again. Then it took a sudden big jump. Ah, so that was his hiding place. The maw of that disgusting carnivorous plant. Well, it's not pleasant, but there's only one way to get it. Don't move, either one of you. My eye is on you. Yes. Yes, it's here. At first, I thought the plant had bitten him. But then he pulled his hand out and I saw what had happened. There was a hypodermic outfit stuck in the heel of his hand. It surprised him no end, but he still managed to hold on to that gun. He swung it away from me and was holding it on Lenore. You... You knew? No. No, I didn't. You must have. Ralph knew. He must have told you. No, I swear he didn't. What do you think I did this for? To, to die and leave you behind? To enjoy the money I got for you? No. You will come with me. Oh, no, you don't know what you're doing. There's someone Shut right... Shut up. Who... What are you looking at? What's behind me? Don't bother to rush him, Sam. I've got it. Hold it, Bill. Yeah. How's that for shooting, Sam? Yeah. You find a bullet hole in him, Bill, and I'll call it good. And that, Deputy Deer, is the crop. And it's all carnivorous. In case you're still wondering what dropped him when your shots missed, it was the poison in that hypodermic needle which Ralph had planted there for that very purpose and then baited the trap of the all-important missing medicine. Later on, I learned that what the doctor had been feeding him was the right medicine for what ailed him, an isotope of iodine. It seems it's radioactive like uranium, but if you take too much of it, you die. Not of poisoning, but of pernicious anemia, which is how the doctor planned for Ralph to die. It also magnetizes watches so they don't keep the right time. And if they're cheap ones, like mine, they may stop altogether. Uh, period, and a report. Got all that, Buffy? Mm-hmm. I got it, Sam, but I don't get it. Uh, Buffy, people have studied all their lives to learn about atomic stuff like isotopes, and you expect me to teach you everything in one easy lesson. Oh, no, Sam, I know about that. But who killed who? Whom, dear? The doctor killed everyone, but Ralph loaded the needle. And they were accomplices? No, Buff, get this. It's real shallow. Ralph knew there was no way in the world to prove that the doctor was killing him and hastening his aunt's demise. So he saw to it that she got a dose of detectable poison and did himself the same favor. Oh. Now, uh, like a good girl, go type that up. Hmm? And now, listen to this. More and more millions agree every day. Wild Root Cream Oil has become America's favorite hair tonic Because of the neat, natural way it grooms the hair. Because of the quick, easy way it relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. Get non-alcoholic wild root cream oil with lanolin right away. And ask your barber for a professional application of wild root cream oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. I certainly hope that butler was brought to justice. What for? His dialect? Oh, for helping to deliver the threatening letters and then stealing off the occasional table. A brilliant deduction. How did you deduce? Sam, that's for kids. If Ralph was too ill to walk, then somebody had to push him upstairs in the wheelchair. Now, wouldn't it have been easier just to carry him? That's how he did it? Or uh, just go up himself? That's how. Possibly, and then again, we may never know. But uh, do we care? Hmm? Yes. I hate loose ends, Sam. Then keep it up. <gasps> Good night, Sam. Spoken like a true perine, so I'll say to you, good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene and Pierre Garrigan. 
Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. An interesting episode. I love the setup and the close. And they did a great job really just heaping on the atmosphere. Though it was a little weird for the sheriff to say that it was so hard to find that a prowler couldn't find it. And then to also say that, you know, you could get to it right off the bus. Now, of course, we had an episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers where a guy committed burglaries by taking the bus and getting off. Also, I think that the guy who played the sheriff also played uh, Dundee. Of course, this series does have a bit of a rep company feel to it, but it's a, shall we say, unimaginative casting choice to have the guy who plays the regular police spoil play the guest police spoil. And it was also sad that we got another episode where Effie was absent. Apparently, this was just due to her not feeling well, as Martin Grahams doesn't indicate that she was out for the next episode. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback. And on Facebook, we have a comment from Peter regarding the Bumpus Hellkeeper. I used to love Bumpus Hell as a kid. The combination of name and boiling cauldrons of mud appealed to me. And he shares a photo of him as an adult uh, visiting the location. And he says, I enjoyed the writers using the name as a spot in the fictional Western story. Well, thank you so much for sharing, uh, Peter. I appreciate it. And we have a Facebook message. This one comes from Bean. Have you posted anything from I Was a Communist for the FBI? It's my favorite old-time radio show I've found so far. I'm looking for funny detectives or something similar to the style of the aforementioned show. Uh, okay, I guess I will say on that point, we haven't played I Was a Communist for the FBI. It's not a detective program. In terms of series that might be in its style, uh, I think there are several that I, I would point out uh, in kind of the espionage vein. Obviously, we have Dangerous Assignment. And then the predecessor series to that, The Man Called X. But there's also a Mr. I.A. Moto, which we played several years back. And then on The Amazing World of Radio, we did a series starring Ilona Massey called Top Secret, which I think all would be interesting in that regards. As to funny detective programs, it's kind of hard to tell. You know, because humor is a bit subjective. Now, there were detective comedy programs, but many of them were not terribly funny. Like, I don't think that Meet Miss Sherlock or Sarah's Private Caper were hilarious, although they did have their moments. I think the adventures of Leonidas Witherall, which we played back in Season 3, was... Pretty amusing. Many of the hard-boiled programs have an element of humor that really does tend to shine through. Uh, things like uh, Candy Matson, uh, the Pat Novak for Hire series, Jeff Regan with Frank Graham. Of course, I would also say Richard Diamond and Rogue's Gallery. Uh, Richard Diamond 
has some really hilarious uh, episodes. And if you like that sort of unintentional, this is ridiculous sort of humor, the programs of Frank and Ann Hummer, you know, Inspector Thorne and Mr. Chameleon and Mr. Keen Tracer of Lost Persons really have that going for them. And I would say to an extent, so does Philo Vance. Bean continues on, I recently Googled, found a web page with your post, and am listening to the private files of Rex Saunders. I live in the Pacific Northwest, too. I'm glad you're posting stuff like this for another generation. Have a great day. Well, thank you so much, Bean, and I appreciate you uh, listening, and so glad you found us. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Bill, Patreon supporter since November 2020, currently supporting the program at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Bill, and that will do it for today. A reminder, if you want to be sure to never miss an episode, I encourage you to follow the podcast using your favorite podcast software, including TuneIn, Spotify, or the Good Pods app. And if you are enjoying this podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We'll be back next Monday with another episode of Sam Spade, but join us back here tomorrow for Michael Pive per Private Detective when... Say, Scarface looks kind of mad. A Portuguese gentleman with a parrot has bid $11. Will the Swedish gentleman say 12 Yeah, I bid $12. 30 20 50 I got 50 whole oh, save. These men must be crazy. Either that or they must know what's in that box. Okay, now, quiet, please. Now, this is really worthwhile. Apparently, both of these gentlemen want this box. The Portuguese has bid $50. Will you say... 55! And the Swede says 55! 60! Sold! Sold for $60 to the Portuguese gentleman with a parrot on his shoulder. In all honesty, this has got to stop somewhere. (laughs) Here, senor, the $60. Thank you, sir. And the mysterious box is yours. Muito obrigado. No, you don't get that box. They fix you good. Get away. Stop. Do you make a put to this better? Michael, the sweet has a knife. Oh, take that parrot away. The parrot is scratching my face. You will try to knife me, eh? That is my knife. Give me back my knife. You want back the knife, eh? All right. Here's the knife. Take it. Oh, oh. He stabbed the sweet. You men, stand back. Step aside. Oh, oh. Portuguese knife. Auctioneer, call an ambulance. Michael, the Portuguese is running away. Here, you come back. Somebody stop that man. Come on, get me. got to catch that fellow. All right. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at Great Detective. Detectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.